Bonjour tout le monde. Donc, euh, on va commencer le panel suivant. Euh, je vais laisser Sam se présenter en premier. OK. Uh, so this afternoon, uh, we have the panel with our uh, seed producers here. And we have, um, well, I guess I'll introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Samuel. I work with uh, Seed Change now um, and have for a couple of years. Oh, I'll talk louder. Um, I have a bit of a connection with this space here uh, at the Roulant. I was one of the co-founders along with my friend Howard here and Tim Murphy, who is not here. Um, but I have a really nice uh, kind of memories of this space and I continue now with, uh, with Seed Change to work out in Senville on uh, a land Uh, farmland out on the West Island where we're doing uh, some seed research projects and working along with the Roulant Farm and uh, Ferme de Lille on some different farming projects there. Bonjour, je m'appelle Marc-Claude, je vais co-animer le panel aujourd'hui avec Sam. Euh, moi, je viens de finir ma première saison en tant que productrice de semences. Je fais affaire avec des compagnies de semences régionales dans le nord-est euh, américain, là, donc euh, nord-est du Canada et un peu aux États-Unis aussi. Um, puis j'ai travaillé avant avec euh, Daniel de la ferme Tournesol. Um, donc aujourd'hui, euh, le thème du panel, c'est euh, comment on développe le secteur des semences biologiques dans le nord-est américain. Donc ça, c'est un, un sujet qui, qui est très pertinent, bien sûr, dans un contexte de, de croissance de la demande pour des semences locales et des semences biologiques, autant de la part euh, des... Euh, des jardiniers, des jardinières, euh, des centres jardins, mais aussi des, euh, des agriculteurs et des agricultrices. Donc, euh, on va tenter de un peu dresser un portrait de ce, de ce contexte euh, régional-là, avec euh, quatre compagnies de semences euh, ontariennes et euh, québécoises et américaines aussi. <rire> uh, so, we're going to focus in on five... Uh, <coughs> five key themes today, and each of those themes we'll kind of dig into a little deeper after our presenters kind of present their uh, companies. Um, and at the end of each of those themes, we'll spend about 15 minutes on each theme. We'll also kind of open it up at the end of each of those themes just so people had other questions or things which perhaps we didn't cover in sort of the questions that MC and I had come up with. Um, and you can put up your hand if you have a question at some point. We'll try to mark it down and get to you at the end of that period. So I think we could commence uh, now with uh, opening with our presenters. My name is Heron Breen. I am from Maine in the United States. And I drove over here last night at the invitation of uh, Hugo and Rebecca to participate in this. And um, thank you so much for having me. And I really just want to say thank you so much to the folks who are doing the double interpretation. They're making us all uh, hear and speak the language of seed. Uh, if I had another occupation, I'd be doing that. It's incredibly amazing. And they're speaking to themselves in languages, giving themselves compliments right now as I talk. Um, <laughs> so I work, so I'm here today, I'm here today in a couple different capacities and in tomorrow a different capacity. Today, I'm here, um, I'm wearing the corporate shield shirt. Uh, I work for Fedco Seeds, which is based in Maine. And we sell seeds Uh, all over the United States, but our primary market is the Northeast. Uh, we have 22,000 customers, um, and we're a, we're a, a, a consumer worker cooperative. So both the workers and the consumers are owners of the business, and we distribute our profits accordingly. So it is not a business where somebody has a camp on a lake and the rest of us are living in shacks. I do live in a shack, but I, I do not have a camp on a lake. Um, but I've been working at Fedco uh, for 20 plus years. So I started there when I was 22 years old. Um, and uh, it was really a job that uh, happened because I got very ill with a serious immune system disorder. Um, and I still, which I still deal with. Um, and I had no interest in farming, even though I grew up doing gardening and farming with my parents uh, and working on farms in high school. And I thought I wanted to run away from the city and drive a Ferrari, uh, but I got sick and uh, very ill. And I ended up losing, basically, uh, imagine me weighing 110 pounds. That's basically where I was at at that point. Um, 
And so I started working on a farm with a friend because I was very bored because I couldn't do anything. And I just realized I knew how to weed and pick, pick things. I, didn't, I knew what a weed was and what a tomato was because I grew up, grew up on a, you know, a, 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 we're doing that. Um, and uh, I said, geez, this is really nice. I go, to, I go do this for three or four hours a day for no pay because I needed something to do. Uh, and I felt better at the end of the day than I, when I went there. Um, just sitting in the beans, like communing with the beans. Uh, and Fedco was willing to deal with me when I was very ill, and they let me come work there part time. And now, today, I uh, run the research and, and development department at Fedco, which is really just me. <laughs> so it's not really a department. <laughs> um, but we, this is the trial program at Fedco, where we trial vegetable varieties from all over the world, um, both open pollinated and hybrid varieties. We collaborate with farmers to do this, so we actually pay farmers in our region uh, to be the trial sites for the farm. So we pay them by the plant or by the row foot, um, and actually pretty good, meaning that some folks have been doing that with us for like as long as I've been there and longer, and that's their primary, or at least like a good chunk of their farm income is the money they get from trialing with us, doing research. So I spend most of my summer from my day job running around, visiting various different farms, and then running back to our chicken barn where our offices are and preparing lavish trial feasts for everyone at the warehouse with 30 different types of cabbage and 20 different types of onions until everyone wants to vomit. So. I'm kind of, I have the best job, but everyone like sort of loathes, but also appreciates me because I'm like, you must eat these 30 varieties of radishes and tell me what you think. Or you must eat these 30 varieties of melons and tell me what you think. Um, I also run a farm on my own so spare time, the other 80 hours a week that I have uh, when I'm not sleeping five hours a night. Um, and that farm is about six acres of produce or seed crops a year. Um, I rent about 12 acres of ground, um, and most of what I do is plant breeding and seed saving on that farm that developed out of market farming and gardening. So I'm working 40 hours a week at Fedco, and I don't keep track of what I work on the farm. Um, so just as a conflict of interest, Marie Cloud has been growing some seed for me, so I've told her to ask me the hardest questions rather than the easiest questions because I've paid her money. So, just so you know. Um, but I'm here today to basically, we sell seed to Canada from the United States. We also have seed growers in Canada that grow seed either on contract or they're growing interesting things that we would like, Daniel being one of them, that we purchase their seed from them. Um, but, you know, I see the region as a region. There's, we have way more in common in Maine with Quebec than I do with New Jersey. You know, we share the same weather, we share the same uh, food culture, we share the same language. Uh, there's lots of different French-speaking communities in Maine. Um, so we have a lot in common, and we should be collaborating on both our seed supply and how to grow good seed. So I'm here to offer whatever I can to that conversation, and hopefully the frustration in me speaking strictly in English will be uh, offset by information I might be able to offer. Greta Krieger, I own Greta's Organic Gardens, seed company, seed grower in Ottawa. Uh, I started farming in 91 when I moved out of Montreal to Eastern Ontario and started, spent the first 10 years growing both vegetables and producing some seeds little by little and having chicken, turkeys and all kinds of stuff. And only towards around 2000, 2002, when I moved to my farm in Ottawa, uh, I decided that I wanted to do seed production full time. Uh, it still took a few years after that to be able to turn, a, turn around and not having a, a second job to pay for the bills. So the last 14 years, I've been making my living on on my seeds and my plants in the spring. Um, I have decided to stay small, uh, sell my own seeds, plus I get seeds from other bigger growers. Uh, I can't grow all my own seeds. Um, 
But I decided to stay small, sell from my website. So let's see the Saturdays. Um, and then sell plants at my farm. Since I'm right in the city, it's an ideal spot to sell bedding plants in the spring. And I've been doing that on, on my own the last 14 years. The, the last four or five years, I have not had any, I have a helper that comes in the spring to do the transplants with me. My husband does about two days a week on the farm. Other than that, we don't have any help. We decide to stay that small compared to a lot of other ones. I don't sell wholesale. I don't sell. I don't put seed racks out anywhere. I decided to stay this way because I like to be in control of what I'm doing, and um, I like you get you get fairly efficient at what you're doing when you're working on your own and setting up your own equipment. So I don't think I work more than like 50, 60 hours a week year round on, on this. And I'm, um, I think the last few, five, six years, my, my total sales in the years is probably about $150,000. Um, and I, I'm, I'm quite fine with that. I, I try to, not to grow the last four or five years because I do want to retire. Next year will be my last year of doing seed production on that scale. Uh, I'll keep my seed company going, but I will not, I'll not be producing seeds after that. Um, but I do have somebody who's taking over. So it's not gonna be, um, be gone either, but uh, uh, it's, it's doable, it takes a, a fair lot of time before you can actually start making money on it, but you know, it's, it's doable. And I'll still keep on the breeding project we've been going on for years, and we're just gonna, I'm still gonna keep those ones going. Dan? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> me? <laughs> Everybody's gonna hear me. Ok, alors euh, où est-ce est qu'on était? <rire> alors, euh, euh, j'ai euh, démarré la euh, coop tournesol avec euh, quatre de mes amis euh, de l'université. Et par la suite, il y a deux autres personnes qui se sont joints à nous comme coopérants. C'était des employés depuis plusieurs années. Puis là, ils sont rendus des coopérants avec, euh, avec les cinq membres fondateurs. Alors, on est sept personnes à ce point-ci qui, 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 euh, qui détiennent l'entreprise. Et en plus de nous sept, on a sept employés qui travaillent pour nous autres aussi. Alors, on a un total, total de 14 personnes. Voici l'équipe. Puis, euh, sans tout ce grand, cette grande équipe-là, on ne pourrait pas faire ce qu'on peut, euh, ce qu'on fait. Alors, euh, on est très... Euh, on est très content de les avoir avec, euh, avec nous autres. Euh, alors, nous autres, on est à l'ouest de Montréal, environ 45 minutes ici, sans trafic. Ce qui est ces jours-ci, c'est pas, ça n'arrive jamais. Mais il y a 15 ans, ça arrivait à l'occasion. Euh, alors, ça, c'est notre terrain. Euh, en fait, on est un peu aussi au, loin, au l'autre côté de la, la, de la fossée. Alors, on a 17 acres au total. Sur ces 17 acres, quand on enlève la grange, les grands euh, sentiers pour les tracteurs, ça revient à 12 acres qui peuvent être cultivés. Puis sur ces 12 acres-là, il y a 7 acres en production commerciale. Alors les 5 autres acres sont en engrais verts pour notre rotation. Puis avec les 7 acres, on a 6 acres de production euh, comme, comme maraîcher, puis un acre en semence. Euh, alors, euh, on est des maraîchers en plus. Euh, Malgré qu'on a toujours euh, cultivé des semences, euh, on a commencé surtout comme euh, production maraîchère. Et euh, à ce point-ci, on a fait des marchés, on a fait différentes choses, mais à ce point-ci, on fait juste euh, des paniers euh, bio euh, de l'ASC. Alors, on a 500 membres par semaine qui ramassent des légumes chez nous, euh, peut-être à moitié à la ferme, puis euh, peut-être un tiers à la ferme et, et deux tiers dans le West Island de Montréal. Et euh, ça, c'est neuf par personne de notre équipe produisent les légumes. Puis, les cinq autres sont dans les semences. Alors, euh, on produit des semences, puis c'est pour ça que moi, je suis ici aujourd'hui. Euh, ça, c'est un, un champ de Mizuna, c'est un, un crucifère, alors euh, rempli d'abeilles. De, de, euh, quand on récolte, on utilise des équipements très high-tech. Alors, ça, c'est pour, euh, 
pour tamiser les semences, pour enlever ce qui est plus gros de ce qui est plus petit. Et par la suite, on va vanner avec des ventilateurs. Alors, c'est des systèmes qui sont euh, n'importe qui d'entre vous pouvez faire euh, ça. Puis, on a d'autres équipements aussi, mais euh, la grande majorité de ce qu'on qu fait, c'est avec des équipements de ce genre-là. Puis, pendant longtemps, on avait juste ces équipements-là. Puis, euh, tu peux faire beaucoup avec, avec ça. Alors, ce n'est pas la technologie qui est limitante pour la production de semences. Et euh, une fois que c'est propre, on met dans les sachets. Puis... Euh, on les vend, <rire> ou on les utilise nous autres aussi. Puis nous autres, alors on a une boutique en ligne, puis on vend des semences à travers ça. On, on va une douzaine de, de fêtes des semences à travers le Québec, puis un peu en Ontario. En plus, on a des présentoirs de semences euh, dans des, dans des, euh, des pépinières, des, des magasins de produits naturels euh, et autres. Et euh, on vend des semences à d'autres compagnies, euh, comme, comme Fedco. Il y avait un temps où on produisait des semences pour une douzaine de compagnies de semences, ces, ces temps-ci, il y a juste quelques semenciers qui, qui achètent nos semences encore. Puis c'est un peu, c'est de notre choix. On, on a juste un encre qu'on produit des semences euh, avec. Puis c'est rendu que on réussit à vendre presque tout ce qu'on a à travers des sachets. Alors à ce point-ci, nous autres, on a notre, notre propre réseau qui produit des semences pour nous. Entre autres, il y a Marie-Claude. Il y a d'autres personnes dans la salle. Euh, je pense qu'il y a trois ou quatre personnes qui produisent des grandes quantités. Puis, il euh, y a quelques personnes qui produisent des plus petites euh, quantités. En fait, Samuel aussi, euh, il y a longtemps cultivé pour nous autres. Euh, alors, c'est euh, nous autres, à mesure qu'on a grandi, ce n'était pas en produisant nos propres semences, mais surtout, euh, à ce point-ci, on vise à produire la semence de fondation qu'on va fournir à d'autres semenciers pour euh, reproduire pour nous autres. Mais on produit aussi quand même, tu peux quand même beaucoup produire sur, une, sur un, un arc de semence. Alors, euh, euh, puis euh, quand j'ai démarré euh, en semences, il y avait quand même, il y avait moins de littérature au niveau de, de production maraîchère, mais il y avait quand même beaucoup. Il y avait les livres d'Elliot Coleman et autres, mais il n'y avait pas vraiment d'équivalent de semences. Puis c'est quelque chose que j'ai beaucoup cherché. J'ai trouvé quelques très bons livres, mais c'était vraiment visé pour des jardiniers. Puis euh, j'ai découvert qu'il y avait un monde, euh, quand j'étais dans, dans l'Ouest Coast, uh, Organic Seed Alliance, c'est là que j'ai découvert qu'il y avait plus de, de ressources. Puis... Euh, mais un peu du... Puis j'ai beaucoup appris en demandant toutes sortes de questions à toutes sortes de semenciers. Entre autres, Greta, j'ai posé beaucoup de questions dans, dans, dans mes débuts. Mais euh, à ce point-ci, où ça fait quand même plusieurs années, j'essaie de propager aussi mes connaissances. Alors j'ai un blog, goingtoseed.net, où j'écris sur la production de semences. Puis en fait, aujourd'hui, j'ai publié un article sur cette radis-là, à chair noire, puis à pas à chair noire, à peau noire et à chair rouge. C'était quelque chose qu'on a développé récemment. Ça fait dix ans qu'on travaille dessus, mais que... On va vendre cette, cette idée, à cette idée, cet, euh, cet hiver. Alors c'est, euh, ouais, alors ça c'est, en plus d'être de, 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 cultivateur, j'écris euh, aussi. Puis un autre chapeau, euh, ça c'est, euh, euh, c'est un livre que je suis co-auteur avec un de mes co-fermiers euh, sur la planification des cultures euh, pour des euh, pour des maraîchers. Puis ça amène à un projet que j'ai démarré cet été. Puis ça c'est euh, The Farmer's Spreadsheet Academy. C'est un projet très niche. <rire> c'est pas tout le monde euh, qui peut entendre parler de ça, mais il y a un certain cible, euh, marché cible pour laquelle euh, je suis parfait. <rire> um, puis um, finalement, un peu, je joins ces deux choses-là, um, uh, puis ça c'est l'aspect pub dans mon, ma présentation, mais um, uh, fin décembre, début janvier, je vais donner un petit cours, des cours euh, en ligne sur la Production de semences, mais surtout sur la planification de semences. Alors ça, c'est un, un cours qui est en fait visé pour des maraîchers qui veulent démarrer en production de semences, mais il y a un des quatre cours va être sur la production de, de non, la planification de sur la, la production semencière. Alors ça peut euh, vraiment aider n'importe qui ici, même s'ils si ne sont pas maraîchers. Euh, c'est des cours gratuits. Alors je vous encourage à, à le suivre. Mais euh, ouais. Alors ça c'est ça c'est les autres projets que je travaille avec euh, ces jours-ci. Alors ça c'est moi. Puis je vais transférer à Kim. Yeah. Aim it this way. Hi. No, no, no. Oh no! I oh, I'm not. <laughs> And I'm gonna stand over here. No. Okay, I'll stand here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so uh, my name is Kim Delaney, and I farm. I own a farm called Hawthorne Farm, and we have a little seed company there. So I'll just give you an overview of what we do. 
So um, we're in Palmerston, Ontario, about eight hours from here. <laughs> and uh, we've been certified organic since 1996. Uh, we've been offering seed, uh, vegetable, herb, and flower seed since 2008. That was our first catalog. And the following year, we had our first website, 2009. We sell mainly online and, and only across Canada, although we smuggle seed into North Korea. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so uh, we have a catalog. We do a lot of custom packets, sort of like... Uh, uh, promotional materials for companies and wedding favors and that type of thing in the second half of the year. So that complements our cash flow um, throughout the year. Uh, we also have a wholesale rack program, which I have a love-hate relationship with and threaten to drop every year, but so far it's still going. We sell at CD Saturdays and we also have people come out to our farm to, to purchase seed. Um, our main customers are gardeners and small farmers. So we offer bulk sizes, but our bulk bean or pea packet is more like 200 or 400 grams as would be the largest. So not huge, we don't sell to large farms. Um, we're a family-owned uh, and run farm. These are not my kids. Um, my partner Brian and I own the farm. He's a blacksmith and a tool and die maker, so he can fix tractors and all that kind of stuff and make metal things. He also has an off-farm job, like many farmers. Um, and then I had, I've had uh, the maximum employees I've had are two full-time, year-round employees. So Aaron and Kelsey. Uh, Kelsey has a MA in. Um, criminal justice policy and just got a job in that field. So we just lost her. So it's right now Aaron and myself full time and we hire seasonal workers. So starting in, actually we have one seasonal worker two days a week now and in the new year we will have two um, each doing three days a week and then we'll have occasional packers coming in. So we're not big but we make a, a good living uh, and we work year round. We also, so we sell vegetable, herb, and flower seed. It's all certified organic. Um, we, my background is restoration ecology, uh, tall grass prairie restoration. So I know native plants better than anything, the Ontario native plants, anyhow. Uh, so we sell a lot of native grasses and flowers as, as, as well as vegetables and flowers and such. We focus on open pollinated seed. We have not yet created any hybrids ourselves and we don't sell hybrids from anyone else so we really believe in doing the work like uh, Frank Morton does a lot of work improving um, open pollinated varieties trying to clean them up select them and work on them we're not focused solely on heirloom seeds or older varieties we believe that a lot of open pollinated seed work that's being done now might be the heirlooms of the future and it's just as valid and important and needs doing so we do that we have, um, I'm also lately, or we focus on short season varieties and we love food, so flavor is important in the varieties we choose to offer. Uh, I'm personally very excited about land race populations, sort of broader genetics of, of plants. So an example of a land race would be um, the most shadow that was being talked about earlier, the butternut type squash. Uh, Joseph Loft House is a farmer who's in Utah, Utah, and he's up pretty high, has a short growing uh, season. He, um, he grows, he, so he took all the moshada he could find and select for the earliest ones. And what he end, and then he grew them out again and selected for flavor. And he ended up with this population, I have a picture of it later, of um, all different shaped tan squashes. So some like butternuts, some like pear, big fat pears, some like big round pumpkins. And, but they're all machadas, they all taste good, and what I love about it is the genetic re variability or genetic diversity of the mix, and therefore the resilience to adapt to changing climate. So that's where my personal excitement is right now. We have 3.5 acres-ish in seed uh, on our farm, and we use uh, a number of contract growers. Uh, not use, that's terrible. <laughs> we work with a number of contact growers. Um, here's a few people, some of them are in the room today, but our main growers right now are uh, John Ambrose down on Peely Island. He does a lot of growing for us. And Tucker, who's 12 here and is now, uh, I think he's 18 now. He and his mother have been growing for us and with us since he was 12. He's a, a genius. 
So we work with a number of growers. Um, we focus on the crops we can do well. We can't grow everything in our climate and, and have quality seed. So we focus on hot season, wet seeded crops like melon, watermelon, squash, tomato, you can read it. Um, and hot season, dry seeded crops like beans, onion, and sweet corn. Those are our, the things we grow lots of. We also, these crops are more difficult for us. The cool season, dry seeded crops and the warm season dry seeded crops because um, we tend to be quite wet in the fall and our seed uh, like spinach uh, sorry lettuce seed in the fall when it, the seeds drying down it's raining a lot and the little cup that holds the seeds also holds water and there's disease issues so we can't grow all of our seed if we want quality seed we focus on the things we can do well and buy in other things uh, what I like about working at this scale is I can control the seed lot size. So if I'm buying in seed, I may have to, or contracting seed, I may have to order large quantities, but I can offer many, many flowers because I can do smaller seed lots, and then I can do large seed lots of the beans and corn, things I need. I like that. Um, we also get to select when we walk our fields, we get to select our crops for the attributes we like, like taste, size, or earliness. And we're very familiar with our varieties because we grow them all out, whether it's just in our food garden or for seed. Um, and our crops have grow year after year after year on our farm, on rotation, not every year. So they're regionally adapted to our zone five climate. Um, the main issues for us, it's a, an issue of scale. Like, so we, we can't harvest our beans with a combine. We're too small, but we can harvest them by hand because we're too big. So it, it has been an issue, but we've all worked it out. Like we're, we're finding the right equipment. We met my blacksmith partner. He can make equipment. So we make, we, we find, we, over the years we have found equipment that works for us. But it's a bit of a, a it, that was a main challenge. Another challenge we have is we're surrounded by corn. We're in the corn belt and it's all GMO corn. So um, I won't go into it now, but we've found ways of circumventing that. This is a cob of sweet corn that we grow that's contaminated with ge genetically modified field corn. You can see that loud and proud GMO kernel right there. Just a few ways we work with people. Um, we've released a tomato that a local farmer, Corey Eichmann, developed, a greenhouse tomato called Biziki. Um, we work with Dan and Greta on our <laughs> now defunct, but maybe we'll bring it back, Pepo project. There are so many Pepo, cucurbita Pepos, and uh, we can only grow one a year on our farm, so we kind of pool, work together and pool um, our growing abilities at times. We had a little project called Seeds of Transition where we worked with local farmers. Um, they grew a seed crop, we cleaned, harvested and cleaned it, and then gave them half the seed and we kept half the seed to sell. What happened to that project is a whole bunch of babies came <laughs> and the farmers are busy at the moment. <laughs> um, we've also done a lot of work with Abir and the Bauda and every, a number of you are here. Um, and then a recent a collaboration we're doing is with um, a, a small group of us have a little, we like to say, um, a little plant breeding club where we're, we're trying to breed uh, open pollinated varieties that we think are ne needed. Um, so that's a new project that we're working on and we'll probably talk about that a bit later. Um, I, I won't go into this, uh, we we're asking questions but we'll talk about this later, but I just wanna show you this is the picture of the loft house Moshada, land race population. So broad range of genetics, they all taste good, they store well. Um, a lot of farmers don't seem to like them, market farmers. I personally love them. And um, the issues of interest, I would really like today to talk with you, all of you about this idea of developing a network of Canadians, Canadian seed growers, because getting seed across the border is sometimes tricky, not always. Um, and I, I love talking about this idea of these uh, plant breeding clubs, if anyone wants to talk about that, and um, how we can continue to network together. Like, do we keep EcoSign going or, or what? I'd like to talk about those things with you today. <laughs> thank you, thank you everyone. Um, I just wanted to go in like an overview of what uh, topics we'll be looking at and then MC will dive into the first one. 
we're kind of going more for a bit of an in-depth conversation about seed. Um, and like I said, if we haven't got to one of the questions that you maybe are thinking of, you can ask and we'll make sure it gets to the panel. Um, so the key themes. Oh. Um, I think what we'll do is we've got five themes, I'll introduce them. If at the end of the theme you're like, oh, I have a question that's fitting in there but it's not working, put up your hand and we'll, we'll get to the question, I think. Uh, so the five themes that we're looking at, how's the, how's the mic volume working? Okay, uh, so we have the number one uh, is availability of bulk uh, seed and organic varieties in Eastern Canada. Uh, the second theme we're looking at is collaboration models across multiple seed farms. Uh, oh. Okay, I'm going to slow down. Uh, the third is the effective business models and market opportunities for seed companies. Um, and our fourth is contract production and how to get there for new farmers or new seed growers. Uh, the fifth, um, we're looking at organic certification and when it makes sense for farms that are looking to p perhaps transition into organic so they can reach more markets. So those are the five themes. MC will start us off, and like I said, if you have a question pertaining to one of those themes as we go through them, please put up your hand, and I'll mark it down. Oui, donc premier sujet, la disponibilité de plus grand volume de semences, euh, que ce soit pour euh, vous approvisionner. Um, ou sinon, si euh, des, des fermiers, des fermières veulent s'approvisionner en plus grande quantité, est-ce que c'est est-ce euh, que c'est un peu naïf de croire que um, un, un agriculteur ou une agricultrice au Québec peut s'approvisionner seulement en semences locales. Um, Est-ce que c'est un défi pour vous de vous approvisionner en plus grande quantité pour pouvoir fournir ces, la demande? Um, donc, uh, voilà. So, um, <laughs> alors... Uh, je serais, une autre question aussi, je serais curieuse de savoir la proportion de semences que vous offrez qui, qui est produite sur votre ferme. Uh, Qu'est-ce qui... Qu -ce que, quelle, quelle est la proportion de semences euh, qui vient de personnes avec qui vous avez des contrats de production euh, ou sinon euh, la, la proportion de semences qui vient de, de compagnies de semences euh, euh, américaines, par exemple, de la côte ouest? Ou, euh, ouais. um, alors, pour nous autres, je ne connais pas les, les, les chiffres comme des de deux dernières années parce que avec notre expansion, ça change un peu, mais pendant longtemps, 70% des variétés étaient produites chez nous. Il y avait 20% qui étaient produites par notre réseau de, de, de fermiers, beaucoup au Québec, quelques-uns euh, dans le nord-est des États. Euh, puis, euh, il y a 10% qui venaient de sources, euh, de d'autres de, sources, euh, euh, certains, certains euh, sources en gros. Euh, à ce point-ci, je pense que c'est peut-être 50% qu'on produit nous-mêmes, puis c'est 30 ou 40% qui viennent de, de, de notre réseau de producteurs. Euh, mais je ne sais pas exactement, euh, ça fait un bout depuis que j'ai regardé ça de cette manière-là. Euh, la question, c'est euh, par rapport au... Euh, est-ce qu'il y a un besoin pour des semences? Peux-tu répéter la question, euh, Marie-Claude? Oui, j'avais beaucoup de questions. Ben, euh, oui, est-ce que... Ben, J'imagine qu'il y a de la demande de la part des maraîchers euh, pour euh, des plus grandes quantités. Est-ce que les compagnies régionales seraient capables de fournir la demande? Euh, est-ce que vous, vous avez de la misère à, à sourcer, justement, euh, les quantités pour pouvoir euh, répondre à cette demande-là? Ouais. Um, alors, OK. Um, alors, je vais juste mentionner aussi pourquoi est-ce qu'on n'est pas capable de produire toutes nos semences nous-mêmes euh, dès le début. Puis, il y a une partie d'espace que j'ai déjà mentionné, mais aussi le climat. Il y a certaines choses qu'on ne réussit pas à avoir une haute qualité. Euh, des, des, des semences de betteraves, on a eu des semences de, 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 des lots de 85 de taux de germination, mais on a aussi, des, aussi, eu, aussi eu des lots de 50 de taux de germination. Puis je pense, euh, en partie, c'est le climat. Je sais qu'il y a du monde au Québec qui produisent des, des semences de carottes très bien, mais on n'a jamais réussi dans tous les essais qu'on a faits. Alors, il y a plusieurs espèces que, à cause du climat, on a des défis avec. Alors, on, on cherche des... On, on a des liens avec des producteurs dans la côte ouest euh, qu'on achète des semences pour eux autres. Euh, pas pour eux autres, deux autres. Alors, ça, c'est une des raisons pourquoi on ne produit pas euh, tous les semences qu'on offre. Puis, c'est un défi pour fournir des maraîchers dans les semences qu'on ne produit pas. Euh, mais, au niveau de, de vrac, je pense que le défi, c'est un peu... Euh, c'est un cercle vicieux du fait que euh, 
Euh, alors, il faut spécifier un peu c'est quoi les semences qui sont, qui sont, que, que des maraîchers utiliseraient. Alors, si on parle de quelque chose comme tomates ou poivrons, des choses ou des, plan des, des maraîchers ou plantes, des centaines ou des milliers de plants, c'est assez facile qu'ils qu qu achètent ça chez nous parce que tu peux acheter 4-5 sachets de, de, à 3 et 5 ans, puis tu vas avoir les semences, euh, assez de semences. Mais pour quelque chose comme les haricots, que peut-être tu, tu, tu utilises 10, 20, 30 euh, livres dans la saison, pour certains haricots, ça se peut que c'est toute la récolte qu'on a faite. Euh, alors, je pourrais tout vendre à une personne à un prix de peut-être 10, 15 dollars le livre, ou je pourrais diviser ce, 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 cette récolte-là dans des petits sachets, puis revendre dans une quantité qui était peut-être, je sais pas, 50, 60 dollars le livre, ou peut-être une centaine de dollars le, le, le livre. Alors, c'est plus facile pour nous autres, c'est plus rentable pour nous autres de le mettre dans des petits sachets. Um, si on avait une quantité infinie, ça me ferait plaisir de vendre aux au, au maraîchers. Par contre, je ne vais pas produire une quantité infinie sans avoir le marché. Alors, mais si les variétés ne sont pas là, le marché ne va pas ach les acheter. Alors, c'est ça, il y a un peu un défi. Et pour certaines choses, comme des crucifères, euh, comme la roquette ou autre, il y a moyen qu'on produit assez pour, pour le faire. Il y a d'autres choses, comme des haricots ou des, ou des pois, où euh, on a essayé un peu, mais euh, la, les, les, les besoins des maraîchers, c'est juste euh, beaucoup plus grand qu'on qu pourrait fournir. Alors, euh, ça, c'est une partie de ma réponse. Peut-être que je vais laisser à d'autres personnes. Um, I'd just like to say that, um, we, it's echo what Dan said, first of all. And secondly, I like to think of it in terms of, um, there are those things we, we can't produce quality seed here in, in, in the, the Northeast. Um, spinach, beets, um, uh, pole beans we can produce, but they're, they're, they're labor intensive, so we only sell them in packets. Where I see the ability to work together with some, some of you in the room possibly, or, or for farmers and seed companies to work together, is with these things like peas and beans and corn, where farmers require large quantities, and we'll grow large quantities of one or two on our farm, and our growers will do the same, but there's an opportunity if you're a market gardener and, and you want to grow out, um, now Dan, you know the numbers, I'm involved in this, but um, 2,000 pounds an acre. <laughs> my brain doesn't. We're, we're opposite brains, opposite minds like this. <laughs> so we rely. I rely on you, anyhow. <laughs> but I see an opportunity there for um, for some of the crops where we could sell large quantities. Like we limit our bulk and peas and beans mainly to. Um, one, two hundred, one hundred, two hundred, and four hundred gram amounts, and that's that's good for a lot of gardeners. But m market far I'm talking fast. Market farmers, uh, mar some market gardeners need more, and so there's a perfect opportunity to sh when I if I get them from Fedco or Tom, I have to ship them over the border, and there's a lot of costs involved in that, and so I see a, a great opportunity with some of those crops to work with local farmers like we do in our area, but I don't see why that couldn't extend to Quebec and other places. In terms of what we grow, in the breakdown of what we grow on our farm, it changes every year, so I don't have any concrete numbers. And But my sort of visual guess is that we probably do about 60% of our seed um, locally, meaning on farm and with our growers, and buy, in, well, 60 to 70, and buy in, 30 to 40, but like again, do I mean in numbers of varieties or do I mean in volume? I don't know what I mean. I just mean, if you think of our farm, <laughs> 60 to 70 percent, I feel, of maybe volume comes in locally and the rest we buy in. So it, but it, it, that changes every year for us, um, every year, depending on if we have crop failures or our growers have crop failures or, or what. So was there another question or I'll just hand it off? Um, so the metrics of like the ratios of where our seed company makes money and so Fedco is like many companies mostly a repack or, uh, or operation. So many seed companies that you buy from do not grow their own seed. Uh, th this is the sorry. This is the exception. You have folks here on the panel who are growing their who both run companies and grow a, a, a large amount of their own seed. Many larger companies do not grow their own seed. 
Fedco is a company that is fairly small, believe it or not. We are, our total of all departments is $5 million, uh, US dollars. And the seed department is 2 million of that 5 million, which seems like a lot of money, but for an example, Johnny's is about 65 million. Okay, so like a scale, a gas station down the street from me makes as much money as the company that I work for in one year. And that's gross sales, that's not obviously profit. We make anywhere from $30 to $100,000 in profit depending on the year. Um, so what we work with a number of growers who either contract directly with for us, so we're asking them to grow a specific crop um, that we are either supplying the stock seed for or they, are, they have something that they're specialized in or we're buying from a large, sort of a family farm or a larger operation that sort of has like a, a menu of choices but they're kind of specialized in that. Then we also purchase, like many other companies, uh, from larger uh, plant breeding companies. Those can be family owned businesses or those can be international corporations. Okay, so that's probably, it's about a 60-40 split. About say 60% of our seed is kind of, well probably more like 50-50, it just depends on the year where we're where sourcing seeds and this is both open pollinated and hybrid seed. A large proportion of the open pollinated seed in the seed in the larger seed market is actually grown in over, overseas. Um, there's as much overseas growing of open pollinated seed as there is overseas growing of hybrid seed. So in terms of the metric of how a seed company makes money, and this is sort of falls into the question of how to get more bulk seed a little bit, which is that a large scale company has to place an order in advance with Daniel for an example, or a large global seed company. We have to often place those orders six months or a year in advance. We're asking Daniel to grow something for us or he's trying to figure out how much he's gonna grow of something and is asking how much of this do you want? We have to make that decision so that he can crop plan. But is the same with a large global seed company. So we're asking them, hey, we need whatever it is. You know, 50 pounds or in some, oftentimes it's sold by the seed count. Um, and in that situation, if someone from Canada, this is one of the sort of caveats about getting uh, seed across the border, if you decide in February that you would like 50 pounds of something, it's actually not in our best interest to be able to sell that to you because that might end up selling us short because we've already purchased what we can purchase for that year. So another way for farmers to start perceiving this is to start creating relationships and I suspect working cooperatively together to talk with bigger seed companies in advance of saying, okay, I want this next year. So you're telling me now what you want in 2021, but like, or maybe even 20, you know, so that way we can actually place that order with a seed grower or with a larger company and then that can be dispersed by, you know, you can actually send something across the border. So the, the makeup of most seed companies is when you place an order, you basically don't make any margin on a bag, like you were saying, your half pound size of seed, you know, is your bean. I can tell you that when we sell five and 10 pound and 25 pound bags of seed, which we do, to, and 50 pound bags of seed, we don't really make any money on that, okay? But that allows us, those sales allow us to purchase the large amount of seed that the seed grower needs us to buy. So there's a balancing alpha, like of course, we wanna serve all those markets and we need to have the volume by which to place an order. Most seed companies, uh, mo most, most uh, seed supply companies, sort of breeding companies or farmers will ask us or would like us to purchase a minimum amount of seed. Sometimes that's 60,000 US dollars worth of seeds that we have to buy in one season from a company or they will not sell to us. Sometimes there's a minimum per order. So we might go back to that company and they want $10,000 US worth of seed every order that we place with them. So they're saying, we're not, you're not worth doing business with unless you're able to buy a certain amount of seed. So serving the range of growers allows us to do that but everyone makes their money off of the smaller packet sales as, 
you know, Daniel and Kim were saying. So there's this element of how do we serve folks across the border at Fedco at this point? We're really only serving about, you're gonna just laugh at this, there's only about 200 of you <laughs> in Canada that are purchasing seeds from us. They just don't know you. Exactly, that's what I think. Um, but, and that's about 25,000 or $20,000 worth of sales out of that two million. So very small drop in the bucket. And part of that's because folks here are selling seeds as they should. I'm gonna sort of, because I work for Fedco and Fedco doesn't like, this is the real thing about working for a co-op is I don't have to like, I don't have like a chip I have in my brain where I have to like corporate shill and not say anything about how things don't work right. Um, really you guys should create your own seed companies, okay? And really you should be working more directly with the same suppliers that we work with. Um, because it's, there's limitations for us to ship quantity across the border. Partly that is this ordering system, partly is this, the whole ideas of phytosanitary restrictions, which are very valuable. So we can send a small amount of seed or smaller sizes of seeds to Kim and to other folks um, and they'll often repack that or we sell them directly to gardeners or things like that. But it's not enough. It's never gonna be what you need. So the folks that we do business with um, on a larger global scale, which is not exactly the same as local seed, but like many of them would do business with an organized cooperative of growers or of interested seed parties who could purchase their, they don't care who you are most of the time. As long as your money is good and you're gonna meet their minimum, they'll buy from you. I mean, they'll let you buy from them. But the, some of them don't even have minimums for any, or very little minimums. So for an example, the minimum is only the amount of seed. So it's like, they, well, we only sell this in a 10,000 seed seed lot. We don't sell it in a 500 seed seed lot. It's a 10,000 seed lot. That's what you gotta buy. But they don't care, you don't have to buy $5,000, you don't have to buy $10,000. You could buy $2,000, but you have to buy the size that they have. They're not gonna break it any smaller than that. So we're about, you, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're going on. Yeah. We're gonna get actually into uh, more discussions of collaboration um, and more in Canada. And I wanted to just get Greta if you had some points. We've been sorry talking about a bit that. about different scale. I'd like to know maybe. Um, yeah, well, I grow about 75% of my own seeds and the rest I get from uh, bigger companies. I don't do anything on contract or contract for anybody else. Um, just because it stresses me out when I don't get the seeds on time, like my seeds within the next 10 days will be ready to go on my website. The uh, German, the testing has been done. I need to be that because people start ordering early December. So I need my seeds in hand to be able to ship them out. I don't like back orders to be shipped later because it's costly. Uh, now I also mostly deal with small, uh, like home gardeners or market gardeners. Market gardeners, especially for the tomatoes and some of the peppers. Um, so again, the beans and all that kind of stuff come up too. Yes, we can't produce enough. I produce max five kilo of any kind of beans in a year. Um, but just a, a little note, I just got Small Farm Magazine with the new one where they have the seed, seed companies listed in. And I did a fast total on just seed companies who grow seeds in, in Ontario and Quebec. That was listed in there. I, don't, I know that not everybody's listed because I know companies who are not listed. So in, in Quebec, there was 11 companies, small seed companies listed. And in Ontario, there was 15. And um, so I do definitely think that that should be, uh, there's a need to get them together to grow, produce a, a, in, in bigger quantities. I think we have the, the people for it. You just have to get connected. Because there's enough of them producing. And there's more coming. That's I, th I think that Dan had a response and then we actually have a good uh, kind of liaison to the next uh, point and then I'll take some questions here before we go. Um, 
Ouais. Je voulais juste parler un peu de la valeur de la production de semences. Alors, quand, on, quand certaines choses qu'on parle aujourd'hui, on parle de vendre une mise en marché direct aux clients, puis on parle aussi des mises en marché ou, ou des ventes en vrac comme contrat que tu pourrais faire à un semencier ou à un, à un agriculteur. Puis c'est important un peu de comprendre comment ça marche parce que ça a un impact pour, sur pourquoi le monde choisit certaines options. Alors, si on parle de, d'haricots, euh, on, il y a environ c'est 2 à 3 000 livres d'haricots qu'on peut produire par acre. Si, euh, si tu veux faire, si tu as une acre en production, comme beaucoup de maraîchers ce jour-ci, le monde qui ont lu Jean-Martin, puis autres, ils veulent des petites, des petites entreprises, si tu veux viser 40-50 000 par acre, puis tu produis 2 000 livres d'haricots, il faut que tu les vendes à 25 le livre. Alors, si tu as un marché qui va acheter ça, c'est bon, mais ça peut être difficile de faire. Um, alors ça, c'est un problème avec des haricots. Puis surtout, si tu veux aller euh, l'acheter de High Mowing ou Johnny, tu vas trouver ça à quelque chose à 10 ou 12 pièces la livre américain, mais c'est quand même, c'est moins cher. Um, d'autres cultures, c'est autre. Il y, y a des cultures comme souvent beaucoup des crucifères que tu pourrais produire pour 30 ou 40 000 à des prix marchands, ce n'est pas un problème. Um, puis c'est quelque chose comme des tomates. Parfois, ça peut être 200 000, 300 000 l'acre que tu peux produire. Um, mais il faut, c'est, si tu vises à être... En, si tu as juste quelques acres puis tu veux être rentable, tu ne vas pas produire, tu vas pas choisir des pois et des haricots pour la grande majorité de ta production. Peut-être en faire un peu, mais il y a d'autres choses qui vont qui va faire la balance. Alors, c'est ça qui, qui, qui fait un peu une, une difficulté. Mais si tu parles de ce qui est mis en marché euh, direct à des clients, si je parle d'un sachet qu'on vend à 3,50, nous autres, on vise à avoir 25 à 50 sous de semences dans ce sachet-là au prix en vrac. Alors, si, disons que je parle de je sais pas, si, je, euh, comme nous autres, on produit un acre de semences, puis ça, c'est, ça, il y a peut-être une valeur de peut-être 30 000 cet acre-là, si on le, le, le vendrait à une compagnie de semences directement. Alors, à ce 30 000 par acre, ça revient à environ 25 à 50 semences, euh, sous par sachet. Alors, il y a un autre 3 et 25 ou 3 de, je dirais pas de profit, parce qu'il y a toutes sortes d'autres travails dedans. Il y a de l'ensachage, il y a la valeur du sachet, il y a des frais de mise en marché, ton, ton site web. Mais c'est quand même, c'est juste une petite, il y a quand même un meilleur marge que sur, sur, sur le vrac. Alors ça, c'est des, des chiffres qu'il faut en comprendre. Puis c'est pour ça que le monde, quand ils vont démarrer, ils vont viser par des sachets, parce que le marge est plus intéressant. Puis euh, si tu veux produire, si tu as une petite surface, puis tu veux comme... Puis tu veux produire des semences en vrac avant de quelqu'un d'autre. Il y a moyen de le faire de manière rentable. Je pense que Marie-Claude démontre ça. C'est pas toujours facile. On va voir. Mais c'est la première année aussi. Puis euh, il y a d'autres mondes qui le font, mais c'est du travail. Euh, mais ton profit est vraiment en fonction de ce que tu produis. Si tu veux être rentable comme un semencier qui en des petits sachets, c'est pas ce que tu produis qui va définir ton, prof, ton, ton rentabilité. C'est le volume de vente que tu vas faire qui est relié souvent à ton mise en marché, puis ton, ton site web, puis est-ce que le monde est facile à te trouver. Alors, c'est le mise en marché qui fait la grande différence. Alors, c'est pas, c'est pas ce que tu produis qui va faire que tu vas réussir. Alors, si tu veux rentrer dans quelque chose que tu veux travailler t- t- des mains, c'est pas une, puis tu commences à, à combien de semences, là, tout à coup, tu es rendu à faire du marketing, puis à développer un site web, puis à toutes sortes d'autres choses de gestion de l'autre côté que, qu'il faut bien, bien maîtriser. Puis si tu ne maîtrises pas ça bien, c'est, c'est difficile d'être rentable. I think that's a good point to maybe transition to the next point. And we had two questions. Uh. Um, en fait, euh, wow, c'est fort. Euh, en fait, um, je vais, je vais me lever et je vais venir ici parce que je suis quand même... Présentation à nous faire, Non, ben en fait, presque, parce que... C'est pourquoi ça fait du bruit comme ça? Bon. Si tu la sonneau, ça va avoir un feedback. OK. Ici, c'est correct? OK. Euh, c'est juste parce que, euh, dans le fond, j'ai passé... Euh, en fait, j'ai fait une étude de marché pendant les deux dernières années sur le sujet qu'on discute en ce moment. Puis, euh, de cette étude-là, à laquelle j'ai passé vraiment, vraiment, euh, ridiculement beaucoup de temps, euh, j'ai sorti des, euh, des observations puis euh, des propositions que, euh, que j'espérais partager avec vous en fin de semaine. Donc, je saisis juste l'opportunité du moment. Euh, en fait, 
En fait, euh, pendant les deux dernières années, je me suis rendu compte que effectivement, euh, euh, le semencier moyen va euh, va pouvoir avoir jusqu'à 60 de, de, ces, de ces ventes qui viennent de, de produits qui, qui achètent en, en vrac. On va plus trouver autour de 30 habituellement. Puis, en fait, au cours de mon étude, je me suis juste carrément rendu compte que ce serait à ce point-ci, selon la façon qu'on gère le marché des semences au Québec, à ce point-ci, ce serait plus rentable d'être... de d'être euh, comme un gestionnaire en site web ou d'être euh, graphiste puis de simplement acheter des semences puis les vendre que de les faire pousser chez soi puis n'importe qui qui le fait et il y en a plein qui le font, il y a plein 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 de sites comme ça que les gens ils font que vendre des semences, ils produisent rien euh, ben en fait n'importe qui qui le ferait, ça, ça fonctionne ça fonctionne puis puis en fait c'est Oh, c'est vraiment important que euh, qu'on se rassemble puis que on, on mette en place déjà euh, une meilleure organisation des des presque pas nécessairement des règles mais un meilleur encadrement sur comment qu'on fait ça parce que là on fait ça chacun de notre côté puis là vu que vu que tous les sites les gens ils aiment ça aller sur un site pour pouvoir faire leurs commandes au complet mais quand tu sais que les autres semenciers ils ont genre 50 variétés sur leur site. Toi, tu en, euh, en as juste fait 16 dans ton jardin, mais ben, tu sais qu'il va falloir que tu achètes tout le reste sur Internet si tu veux que ton site il fonctionne parce qu'il faut que toi aussi, les, les gens, ils voient autant de variétés sur ton site. Puis, en fait, en ce moment, euh, mon objectif que j'aimerais partager avec d'autres personnes ici avec qui on pourrait collaborer, ce serait que ça nous prend une plateforme commune euh, des semenciers québécois. Puis, euh, sur cette plateforme-là, en fait, il faudrait trouver une façon euh, collaborative que les semenciers puissent mettre l'ensemble des variétés qui, euh, qui, qui produisent chez eux. Parce qu'en plus, c'est super difficile comme consommateur. J'ai fait l'étude aussi comme consommateur à quel point est-ce que c'est facile ou pas d'acheter des produits semenciers sur Internet. C'est super difficile. On les trouve pas, les sites, puis on veut pas aller sur trop de sites. Puis c'est... Oh, quand on cherche un produit en particulier, là, une tomate hâtive, un melon de telle façon, il n'y a pas une façon que c'est regroupé. Il faut faire tous les sites un par un, puis c'est super épuisant. Euh, donc, c'est vraiment, vraiment important qu'on fasse une plateforme commune collaborative. Puis, euh, s'il euh, y en a qui sont intéressés à participer à un groupe comme ça, ben laissez-moi savoir. Il faut qu'on soit une équipe. We're actually going to jump into that topic next, so it's very apropos. Um, there was another question here before. Uh, uh, so, uh, you, you had um, mentioned that there's a problem with like uh, the, uh, uh, the import and export of seeds from US to Canada. Could you elaborate on that problem and if you have any solution and how we can tackle that problem? Because we would like, I would actually like to work on that problem and solve that problem. So. You, you can just you can just give your opinion on it. That's all. Moder moderators, where are we at? I just want to make sure. Yeah, I might. <laughs> if it's okay, I might hold off on answering that question just because we had a bunch of other points. If it, unless you think you want to tackle it right now, is that okay? And we're also out of mic, so I think we're sharing yeah. one mic. So um, I definitely want to answer that question, and I have been thinking about it in preparation for this event. So. Both of you, very thank you so much. I think one of the things that would be good, is good to be in mind is that this is a deconstructed seed system. All these things that we're talking about and sort of like peas and beans, these were like skill sets that farmers had developed and they had appropriate technology for appropriate scale, even in small, well, relatively small scale, 10, 20 acre, you know, plots that is now extinct, meaning that both the, that skill set has gone and that and those machinery has moved to such a scale that we are having hard to fathom this. So one of the great things about Fedco was that we started in the middle of nowhere and that the seed system was at this 
global level. And Johnny's in Fedco and places like that. We were like the small people, but now we have all these other small people. So that smaller, smaller. smaller. but this is the thing: is that small and local necessitates being creative in reinventing much of what and relearning much of what has been lost. So the questions of what is profitable now, those are challenges to meet based upon understanding the skill sets and approaches from the past, as well as the metrics financially today. So th these are complicated interwoven subjects, but like where we're at in the evolution is in a good place, even though we haven't figured out how to solve all these problems. Okay, so we have, I just wanted to say, there's a question here and Dan wants to jump in on that same point. Um, there is definitely a lot of people who jump into starting a small seed company. One of the things they say is, how can we get market growers to grow local seed? And I think that's a really noble goal, but a lot of those people have never been a market grower. Like, I, I, I've been market growing for 20 years, and that experience really, I understand why market growers don't grow, buy, don't buy local seed. and. I understand, like, and there's a reason market growers buy hybrid seed and different kinds of seed. And I think that th that's half the challenge is if we want to tackle that market grower thing, it's not just figuring out stuff on our, on, on our, what works well on a seed farm. It's really figuring out why those varieties are necessary and what you can do with them. And it's, it's hard. And I don't know that that's the low hanging fruit to to go after. I think if we want to really build a resilient seed system, it's not about trying to chase that market. It's about learning how, like, so Heron mentioned bringing back the technologies, but like it's learning how to grow seed and becoming good seed growers for the communities that do want us to grow seed for them. And I think if those seed skills come back into these communities, there'll be a capacity to meet that demand down the line. And, um, and I think that's more important than trying to solve this bigger piece. And it maybe it goes back to what some of, uh, what Val, Valerie, I don't know if I can call you Val, <laughs> but, but was saying is just, is it's kind of learning what we're doing. And, and, and this is in a different context, but it's not trying to solve a problem, it's trying to become better better at what we can do and be the best place in our communities and i think that that's that's true in the in the seed world too and i think there's a lot of kind of just trying to solve agriculture and the food and a big thing and there's a reason our seed system is the way it is and some of it's really messed up of why it's that way but there's also like we don't have massive amounts of people dying across our country because of, of malnourishment. And it's because of how our seed system works. So there's also a reason why, it, like there's a pot, there's, there's good and there's bad. There's a lot of bad, but there's also a lot of good. And we can't just solve the whole thing by tackling one piece. So it's important for us to become really great seed growers so that we can ultimately meet that need when it's really needed. And, and um, breeders too, to some yeah. extent, to get new new varieties. I don't think they're separate things. I think seed savers and seed breeders. Um, I think it's important that they're both the same. Same thing. Okay. Yeah. Ultimately. I wanted. Uh, I wanted to just transition from your question there, which we're going to jump into actually in the next segment. So that's why I didn't jump onto it right away. Uh, the next section is really talking about collaboration, whether that's provincial uh, uh, at a federal or national level here, or even uh, um, between countries, US and Canada. So there was a couple of questions that I was thinking in terms of this, uh, this theme. Um, I participated personally uh, in 2017 um, in sort of like a farmer seed training program with, um, with seed change and the About It initiative. And that was really looking at how can provincially in Quebec, how can we as small scale farmers that are looking to sort of expand the amount of seed we're growing our work and produce a more consistent product be able to sell to bigger companies. And I think there was a group, um, a cohort of people who went through that program and produced seeds. We picked the same variety, it was peas and beans, I think, that year. And we basically went through and did the whole season together and kind of documented things together, did some meetups together. And so this idea of training or sort of people learning to kind of have a standardized or consistent product was important. So that was one aspect. And the other aspect was this idea of collaboration um, to produce bigger bulk quantities which we could sell to bigger companies. So on that theme, I was also thinking of what you were talking about, this uh, seeds in transition, where you were working, Kim, with 
farmers that uh, were growing out crops and you were splitting it. So these are different ideas of collaboration that I was thinking of as you guys were speaking. Maybe we could uh, sort of touch on those points from the different scales, and then maybe we could jump into the bigger scale of more of a, a, a US-Canada collaboration. Um, specific questions, I don't know if there are any, but really, Dan, you were a part of this program, um, and also, uh, Kim, you were talking specifically about this transition, seed transition, so could you kind of speak to this idea of small farmers kind of growing seeds and, and kind of like learning to improve their, their practices to produce a more, uh, better standardized product for your markets? Well, I'll talk briefly about the seeds of transition model, which worked quite well for a number of years until um, young families started happening and then people stepped aside for a, a few years, apparently. Um, so the idea is uh, w regionally, like within, our, within an hour, uh, we're all within an hour of each other, and there would be, uh, I think we had at the most five, maybe six farms that were, um, most of them were CSA farmers and, or, and did market. And, um, and then my farm, which do, does nothing but seed, we just do seed. And so the farmers and, uh, and I decided to work together. Um, they didn't want to have to clean their seed, like to get their seed harvested sometimes even harvested and cleaned um, and germ tested was too much for them but they did enjoy the process and sometimes they had specific varieties that they liked like I know Corey Eichmann had some from Fedco and you weren't in shipping to Canada at the time so he was growing those out but he didn't want to clean them so we decided to work together and the farmers would grow out two sometimes three varieties of seeds sometimes they would harvest and rough clean them and then we would generally pick them up, bring them to our farm, and we had the seed cleaning equipment. So we would clean it, germination test it, we'd do three tests of 100 and take the average germ. And then we would divide the seed up. We would keep half and we would return half to the farmer. So they now had seed that they could use on their own farm or they could sort of use it as like currency or and trade with each other, maybe they had 50 or 100 pounds of peas and they didn't need that much, so they would trade with one of the other farmers in the project who grew something else. They'd keep half of their pea seed and trade for something. So it worked quite well for a while and we were all really excited about it. Um, and I'd love to see it happen again. I mean, I, I got bulk seed to sell mainly to, to, in packets to gardeners, and and the farmers had seed to trade. And uh, we did, we did not just peas and beans, we did peppers and tomatoes and like smaller seeds too. So it, it worked really well. Um, the, I, I guess the, the, the issue where it failed is um, communication when you get busy, you know? You have to really make that point a year in advance to get together, decide who's growing what, what the quantities are gonna be, who's gonna harvest, um, who's going to deliver all that kind of stuff? And but I think that's I mean that that's something it just needs planning, right? So I, I think that model could work quite well. I quite enjoyed being part of it. Anybody? Um, as so, I'm not an involved in a comparable project, but like if there were market growers who really wanted to work with us in the same capacity, we're more than happy to work with them. And we do have one grower for us who had a hard time hitting deadlines and getting the seed to us. So we would just we started getting him to grow the squash for us and get us the squash, and then we'd extract it. Though this year we haven't yet to get the squash, but 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 there's there's ways there's kind of variance, I guess, on that and. Um, I, that's, that's something like that. We would love to, to work with that and, uh, and help people gain their increase their capacity um, that way. Um, one other thing, one of our, our growers on Pili Island, he does a number of things on Pili, like ecotourism and birding, and he has a small um, farm stand. But he, so he just grows seed for us. And again, he doesn't have the equipment to get it really clean. He gets it sort of clean and then brings it to us. But he, so he does anywhere from, I think the most he's done with us is about $12,000 worth of seed in a year, which is really beneficial to his farm. It's, it's a good hunk of cash for him. And I think the lowest would be about maybe $5,000, which is nothing to be, you know, that's a good amount of money too. So even just like contract growing can be quite beneficial like for, in, in, as a collaboration. And then we clean it and germ test it, R fine clean it. 
Is there either of you guys that want to touch on that, that point that we've talked about? No, I don't really grow any, uh, have any cran tracks or grow on cran tracks, so I don't. Um, it's quite common in the United States for small or medium-sized seed companies to collaborate on seed crops with contract growers. So this is like just kind of standard practice um, where we're, we want X number of pounds of something and that person, really it's not worth them growing it if it's not three or four companies sometimes or it just makes it easier for everybody. And sometimes that means that you both end up with nothing uh, because there is crop failures. So um, the the better, the best utilization of everybody's skill on whatever scale is what's important. And I, I think the, the element for me is that seed sovereignty and food sovereignty are one. And so some of what Daniel was saying earlier about crops that can't be grown or not as well grown, well, just forget that for a second because there's a bug called ligus bug that the large scale seed industry is struggling with that's making all of the hybrid carrot seed and all of the hybrid beet seed and all the hybrid onion seed basically gonna have very low germ. So they're struggling with how to deal with this, you know, because of our vast agriculture system of imbalance, something that, you know, a beet, beet seed crop that germinated at 75% might become the norm. So that means that if you can't be ideal, it doesn't mean you can't work small. To me, the, mar the market that Canada as a, like don't try to copy the United States, okay? It's a mess over there, okay? Like I'm driving over here and I'm like seeing that you still have medium-sized dairy farms. I live in a rural state. They're almost like, there's no farms as small as the dairy farms that you have here. And I live in like the most rural state in New England. It's just, you guys are taking, you guys are at a place where you can make some choices in how you're developing your networks and your seed uh, supply. And I think you can be known for quality. So if you become a country and a market that is known for supplying well-selected, well-grown varieties, that is something that is not in existence right now, particularly with open pollinated varieties. Most companies are buying bulked open pollinated varieties from overseas that are, it's not the overseas issue, it's just that it's the way they're being maintained in the IE they're not, okay? There's skilled producers all over the world, but those are basically volume crops. So if, if Canada became known as, so rather than being the, the, the being somebody that's needing something and be the something that we're needing. And I think developing that around those concepts, you know, is really important. Um, you have all of the microclimates in your country to grow a lot of this seed. It exists across your country. It's about being aware of what that means and how to link those together. And of course, we're in that infancy, but just flipping that paradigm of feeling like, we're not meeting, that we need something and becoming the thing that everybody needs. And if you, if you set your sight on that, then you're not basically copycatting whatever crap's going on somewhere else. That's just my, my opinion. Dan, you had a follow-up and then we had a question again from the gentleman here. Yeah, and it's a little bit, it builds on what, what Heron was mentioning. Um, there's been an idea, um, and Tirani just mentioned it a little bit about having a centralized area that people can list their 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 seeds on and be, other people can get that and get seeds from it and bc seeds bc has a has a co-op that's doing something like that the big challenge with centralizing like this is that not all seed growers grow equally good seed and um and that's and that, that's a i think that something like this to really work there needs to be something that's controlling seed quality what Dans la plateforme commune que je suggère, en fait, euh, euh, l'importance est vraiment misée sur euh, la facilité d'accès à la documentation puis un, un meilleur encadrement. Donc, nécessairement, euh, les semences vont être... Euh, on va pouvoir... Euh, ben, 
Là, ça, ça va être avec les différents producteurs, puis on va voir facilement c'est où qu'ils sont, dans quel climat ces producteurs-là, puis euh, une description un peu de, de leur jardin, puis tout ça. Puis à, à chaque, euh, à, pour chaque producteur différent, il va avoir un lien qui va mener à leur site. T'sais, si ça fait trois ans que tu achètes sur la plateforme, puis que les meilleurs résultats que tu as, c'est à chaque fois que tu achètes à la ferme ton un sol, mais ben, tu vas arrêter d'aller sur la plateforme, tu vas aller à la ferme du tournesol directement, tu, sais, tu vas voir, euh, ça va être tout séparé, tu vas pouvoir choisir la zone qui convient le plus à, à ce que toi, ton jardin chez toi, puis... J'avais mal compris ce que tu disais, parce qu'il y avait d'autres projets auparavant qui étaient de plutôt faire une mise en marché ensemble de, de différentes oui. semences. Puis, je vais juste adresser ceci, c'est pas nécessairement ce que tu dis, mais c'est difficile. C'est pas tout le monde qui a des bons taux de germination, c'est pas tout le monde qui a des, des semences sans maladie, puis c'est pas tout le monde qui a des variétés qui sont... Euh, aussi performant que d'autres. Tu peux avoir deux variétés de la, avec le même nom, mais qu'ils agissent très, très différents. Puis c'est ça, un peu, c'est... Je pense que ça revient un peu à bien savoir pouvoir produire les semences pour avoir une bonne qualité, pour pouvoir atteindre ce que, ce que Heron dit. Si on veut avoir des regroupements qui sont connus pour des semences de haute qualité, il faut avoir du monde qui savent, beaucoup de monde qui savent comment produire beaucoup de semences. Euh, tout l'intérêt de séparer les, les producteurs là, dans le... Oui. Euh, mais je pense qu'il y a deux aspects avec ça. Puis même aussi avec, avec ton projet qui est un peu différent, mais il y a l'aspect de producteur, mais aussi il y a besoin de gestionnaire. Il y a besoin de quelqu'un qui gère ou coordonne ces projets-là. Puis ça ne peut pas être bénévole. C'est des choses qui doivent être payé. Alors, il, il, il doit faire de l'argent qui est généré quelque part dans ça. Alors, je pense qu'il y a une demande pour ça. On pourrait avoir une demande pour ça, mais c'est ça, c'est un projet d'entrepreneuriat. C'est pas juste un projet de communautaire, mais oui, mais coopératif, entrepreneurial. C'est c'est juste être un coop. Ça veut comme c'est facile de dire coop, mais ça vraiment ça pas pas facile. Ça fait on change coop depuis 15 ans, puis on travaille. <rire> c'est mais mais c'est il faut avoir du monde qui, qui, qui connaît les chiffres, il faut avoir du monde qui font des décisions, euh, puis euh, puis qui savent bien gérer l'entreprise. Puis c'est un parce que ce qui t'arrive c'est Um, dans, dans le cas de, de la plateforme que tu parles, là, c'est un, un, un peu un, un portail pour voir différents. C'est un portail pour voir différentes entreprises. Puis il y a certaines. Il y, y a comme Pick a Carrot, puis il y a quelques autres, euh, autres choses aux États qui sont comparables. Mais au niveau de, pour de, de, de mise en marché de vente, c'est ce que tu viens, plus ou moins, c'est tu recrées un autre combien de semences. Puis c'est. Une entreprise doit être bien gérée. C'est pas juste. Alors, c'est ça. <rire> Je me répète. Faut, il faut que tous les semenciers du Québec bénéficient de ça, puis que parce que ça, parce qu'avec justement les, pers les les employés de ça, à un certain point, les membres de la coopérative, ben qu'on on soit un groupe pour faire de la promotion, de la renseignement aux clients, pour vraiment comme être. Il va, faut qu'il y ait quelqu'un qui soit occupé à promouvoir puis que ça, ça fasse que ça fait plus de bénéfices pour tout le monde. En tout cas, je, je pense que, je vais juste une chose, je pense que pour démarrer ça, c'est fun de penser à un coop, mais moi je pense que ça prend un individu en très entrepreneur qui veut diriger un coop. Parce qu'avec un coop, tu vas avoir un DG, puis je pense que ça prend cette personne-là qui a une vision puis qui veut le mener à terme. C'est pas, pas avoir des groupes avec du monde qui dit qui, qui fait ça, qui fait ça, qui fait ça. C est, c est, c est, les semenciers, les agriculteurs sont très occupés. Alors, ça prend quelqu'un qui veut mener ce projet. Puis, je pense que la demande est là. Puis, il y a un intérêt pour ça. Puis, comme Heron a indiqué, c'est comme là, là, on parle, on pense un peu à des maraîchers québécois pour acheter des semences du Québec, des semenciers, semencières du québécoises pour acheter des semences. Mais il y a un marché au-delà, aux États, et dans d'autres provinces qui cherchent des semences aussi. Alors, c'est un potentiel beaucoup plus grand que, que juste provincial. Alors, mais avec, il, y a, il peut y avoir une très bonne retombée, mais. Ça ne va pas arriver sans avoir quelqu'un qui a vraiment une initiative, un Steve Jobs, disons, de, de ça. Euh, Peut-être un peu moins, un peu plus généreux, mais, 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 mais moi, je, moi, je pense que c'est ça qui va vraiment démarrer ça. Euh, Puis euh, moi, j'encourage je, moi, n'importe qui à faire. Pas n'importe qui, là, mais quelqu'un qui va avoir du succès à le faire. What about the, uh, 
just, <laughs> Abby, or you studied the Family Farmer Seed Cooperative down in the U.S. It was a model of really skilled seed growers, farms spread out across the U.S., who decided to pool their seeds together and market them. And they're no longer in existence. I bought from them. They were high, high quality. And I don't know what happened to them, but maybe that would be something to research because they were really good. Uh, so I have one question about the, uh, about seed quality in contract growing. So like uh, you, a lot of people are seed, uh, co you, you contract seed, seed growing. So like my question is like, can you explain your process like in detail and how do you ensure quality for the seed that you're getting from your contractors? Is that a question someone would jump to now? Actually, actually, I just want to add up. Um, I want to ask Dan. Like, uh, I heard from one of my friends that you have trained people to grow seeds, and did you make this training material? And how, what what were the details uh, of this program? Could you elaborate on that as well? Well, actually, I could jump in quickly. I've worked for several years for Dan, and I also worked with the uh, Bauda Initiative uh, as a young or a starting seed grower. Um, and actually, Rebecca might actually jump in on here too. Because the thing is, um, so there's a lot of, there was an initiative of a training a cohort of people to go through and try to standardize the production of seeds, so how people were producing their seed. Um, and, and kind of work with them alongside. Over the years, I've worked with Dan um, and sort of done more of like an informal, take photos in the field, that this is, looks like a disease. Um, could you add, tell me how to like, manage something like this? So there's informal relationships like that that I think work. Um, but I guess each producer, and probably a bigger company like Fedco or uh, Kim might be able to speak to you a little more about how, uh, how each company might manage their things separately. But I think Rebecca has a, are you interested in speaking to that? Because you were, I think, in that cohort too, no? A little bit. So the Bauda Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security has different regions. And so the in different regions, the, that mentorship program was managed slightly differently. Um, in Ontario, um, in 2014, I was, uh, I'm speaking up. <laughs> um, in 2014, I was like, I had a, a seed internship, basically, a program where I worked with um, my mentor on the farm, um, and they got a grant in order to let me spend time, like every Thursday I would work in, my, in the seed crop, learning and growing, and that's how that mentorship program worked. Um, but it's really about these relationships. Like when I'm working with Kim, it's like calling up Aaron or Kim or texting or those sorts of relationships I've found very valuable and they go across the borders now and Heron and Michael Mazurik and Petra and like texting and showing photos of like, ah, what is this? That really helps me learn and know that I have people that I'll, I don't know, in a weird way it holds me accountable at the same time. Anyways, I think we're Il y avait une dernière question sur ce sujet-là. Ensuite, on va, on va changer de sujet. Sorry. I just had a question about how to harness the power of the consumer, because I don't think the average person who goes to Canadian Tire to buy McCormick seeds really understands. And I think that if, if seed growers are going to make the most amount of money, they got to find the people who care, who want to know that story, and who will give the extra buck to the seed grower in Ontario in my zone for whatever it is. Because that I would like to find that grower who's got the zone four seeds from Northern Ontario to support my little garden farm or my little market stand. So I just wondered if we if we could hear from the panel how the best ways have been to harness that niche consumer dollar, which is I think enough to fund all of you. Thanks. Ça transitionne bien vers le prochain sujet qui est euh, des modèles d'affaires efficaces et euh, les opportunités de, de mise en marché. Donc, euh, je pourrais vous laisser euh, peut-être répondre à, à la question. Well. It's not, it's not easy to get to change consumers' mind about what to grow. Um, 
what I've done a few times in the summer, I make a tomato tasting. Because I would love people to taste the tomatoes when I sell my seeds, but that doesn't happen. Um, and get to talk. So if they come out and taste the tomatoes, they can take the names down and they talk about it. They put it on Facebook and every so often people compare tomatoes on Facebook and it gets out there and then the questions go out there. Where do you find them? Where do you find plants? Where do you find seeds? If you get into the, to, to the local gardening communities, they'll figure it out. Um, if they talk to each other about what kind of varieties they grow, they compare a lot of that if you, if you get the home gardeners involved. But it's to get to them. It's not easy, but a little at a time. Um, this this uh, issue of bringing new products to market, but also just making people aware of the value of seed is something that everybody is trying to, on a small scale, deal with. Um, I know that in the United States, and, and you also hear there's something called the Culinary Breeding Network, um, which these are many times showcases to intersect between you know people who love food and oftentimes there's chefs involved or restaurants or a, a food cooperative or something as kind of the host or the you know, star attraction where the average person comes and kind of interfaces with food, but also with the understanding that this is seed. This food comes from seed that this producer has grown. And so it creates the connection that food comes from seed and that good flavor comes from good selection. And so creating events, educational events, I think you're right. You know, I think, you, you know, to really develop um, a loyal and fervent um, sort of market for seed, it, it's really about educating folks that it is that quality, that like quality doesn't just happen and flavor isn't an accident. You know, it's like the hard work of the farmer, the hard worker of the seed selection. It's the hard work of bringing that actual produce to you and helping people understand. And obviously, people are somewhat devoid of an understanding of food as a whole. So we're sort of fighting that that problem too. You know, so there's that element of most people don't know how to cook. So the relevance of what. I'm growing this wonderful thing. I've been selecting and it tastes really good. Well, if nobody knows how to cook it, then I'm kind of in trouble. So there's a lot here where we're kind of being asked as seed growers. So I am a seed grower as well as I work for this seed company. But in a way, like there's a lot of challenges being at, tasked with seed, small scale seed production where we're being asked to, to be successful. We have to grow good seed, which is in itself is a challenge. Then we've got to educate people about why that's important and be good at educating. So it does make sense for initiatives like the Bad Initiative, other initiatives, and other like collaborations with chefs and just the community in general. It doesn't have to be hoity toity. It can just be like, hey, these are beans that I grew. We're baking beans. These are like taste five different types of beans baked all the same. There's an awareness that these are all different, but most people don't know that. And so there's that element of like, we have to be sort of marketers and everything. That's a difficult thing, running websites and running all these things and trying to learn, you know, we need everyone's help. We all need this food system to work. So there's a lot of different ways to collaborate, to try to educate folks about the fact that, yes, like I said, food security, seed security, seed responsibility, food responsibility are all linked. So every time we have a food event, if seed could be part of that food event in some way, just to make that connection between the person off the street, that food and seed, that they intersect. Even if they don't get all of the stuff that so many of us will, you know, we can go on for hours about all the minutia, but that seed and food, that's what matters. You know, that garlic comes from people slaving away in October planting garlic in cold soil. You know, like, folks don't understand these things. And that's not necessarily like, they're not like bad because they don't understand it. But it, it's a challenge, you know, we're all very busy. So that's the challenge of how do we grow this system that we need and educate folks so that they know that we're important while doing the work. I think the panel previous to us were speaking much about that as well, of like trying to find the help, but at the same time, like the help can be a problem, you know, all that stuff. It's like 
we're just trying to do the best we can. But I think if every food event had a link with seed, it would be a step. I find that um, having events at our farm are amazing for, for um, people come out, seeing the seed being grown, maybe doing some harvesting themselves, doing a tasting, if it's the right time of year. Tastings get people very excited. And then, um, like a lot of our customers who have been out to the farm are just loyal. They they come every year, they buy from us regularly. Um, and then, like things like Dan's blog, right? I think that brings people in. We have a newsletter that people, some of our customers just love our newsletter, the recipes and all that kind of stuff. And then we have this, like, we had this amazing experience. There's these fire tower sitters who, in um, Yellowknife, who, who are up in these towers looking for fires and they are in remote areas so they have their own gardens. So one of them got our seed and made a garden and just loved it, told another one. Now we have this whole line of fire tower sitters who order from us every year and we have chit chat back and forth and it's like this relationship, this really cool relationship that, that we have. So it's getting to know people whether in person, if you can't come to our farm, it's through the, the newsletter or through the, you know, chit-chatting about fire tower sitting, things like that, bring customers in, but then your seed better deliver, right, you, right after, after making that relationship. But that's how we reach people and hopefully keep them. Um, I think there's two things that are being talked about, and I think that like the sort of the culinary reading networks type thing is really interesting. There's a, proje a project in uh, in Quebec called Arrivage that's um, working with seed growers, farmers, and restaurants, and so bringing it in the public eye that way. And that's a really great way to do that. I think those are all really good, especially for the movement of local seed. But I think those don't necessarily benefit an individual seed farm. And I think that that's what Kim's talking about is the relationship building. And I think that that's where if you want to have a profitable farm that's running a direct market business, you need to be building relationships with people, and it's one at a time, and and it's through newsletters and other things. But it's also it is literally one at a time. So it's that first fire sitter, and then the next one comes out of it, and that's what happens. And there's talking about a, about about business models sort of in the question, and I, I do I think it is important to really remember that this is a business, and it's true if you're running any kind of farm, but it's it's just because you're a farmer doesn't mean you have a right to run a bad business and to have people support you. You still need to be profitable and that comes from running a good, good business and having good marketing practices and also looking at your catalog. And a lot of us come to this work because we have biodiversity goals and we were really interested in protecting heirloom varieties. But if you have a catalog with 600 varieties in it, it can, and I mean, I'm really impressed with what Greta does. <laughs> so I'm not talking about you, <laughs> but 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 it is hard to run a profitable business with like that. And that's something that, as we've gotten into a seed rack program, and we have, you know, like, and, and gotten into colored packets, we've actually seen, you know, our popular varieties, we're selling more of it, and the less popular varieties we're growing, we're selling less, we're, not, we're selling the same, which isn't really as interesting as what the popular ones are, and why do you keep those other ones? You know, if you can sell a thousand packs of something, and you sell 25 packs of something else, those 25 packs, to keep them available, it's a fair amount of work in terms of planning, in terms of the growing, the harvest, and then you have to germ test it, so it's just a lot of fixed costs without even, like, getting into the, the actual work of marketing it, and so, it, it, it's hard to stay profitable if you have a very diverse business. And I think that you've got to figure out what your, and, and figure out what your niche is and work on that and build your clients there. And then if you can do that well, expand larger. And, and this goes back also to, I don't think that for a small uh, seed company, trying to tackle the market garden question is what's going to make you profitable or successful. That's might burn you out. So like look at something and, um, uh, there was uh, uh, Tenenni was talking about having you know trying to have more than sixteen varieties or fifty varieties on a catalog. Okay, but you know if you have the sixteen best varieties of that type, that can actually go a long way. It's just people need to find out about you, and that's where your personal PR campaign really makes a difference. And that's where like I've seen a lot of seed companies and. There, you see them pop up and some disappear and some go a long way, but the ones that survive, 
you know, it's either because of good management skills, but it's also because of good seed. And that, 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 can't be, that can't be stressed enough because when somebody buys seed from you and they put it in the ground and four days later it's germinated, it doesn't matter if it's going to be a delicious t- tomato. Just the fact that they got to that point, like so many gardeners have limited skills that just getting something to live brings them a great joy and that like and, and and you don't get that from all seed you know and you you can you can go to a canadian tire you can get seeds that don't germinate like that and you can also go to some bioregional seed companies in quebec or ontario and not get seed like that and if you're one of those seed companies if you get better seed it's, it's good but but if you're one of those seed companies that has really great seed people will come back to you and they'll come back year after year people really notice good quality and so it's about getting those people in and and making sure you know make sure they have something good and then I mean, it's all about thing about customer service but that's another that's another deal i actually had a kind of a question if there wasn't follow-up on that the more of an interested question for everyone is that you guys are all we're kind of lucky to have seed growers and companies with us here so i was wondering uh, dan had talked about the new uh, uh radish variety you're growing that's pretty exciting i think uh Heron, i know you do some breeding work and are growing some crops Kim and Greta, I was wondering if each of you could maybe just touch on crops that you're growing or that you're going to be bringing to market or that you're just excited about that's kind of been in your stock for a long time that you're really excited to help kind of like popularize or get people interested in. Um, for me, I think I, I've always done a lot of flowers. So I'm, um, I really like getting people excited about some of our native flowers uh, and, and grasses and forbs and grasses. Um, but also I'm very excited about some breeding projects. So I, I recently um, crossed uh, Costata Romanesca zucchini with um, a, a better behaved zucchini bush, mutable. And, um, and then uh, Michael Mazurik took the, the F1 seed resulting from that cross and grew it out at Cornell in the greenhouse and gave me back seed so he saved me a year because he did that in the winter and so then I have I grew it out this summer and have selected so I'm excited I don't do near, nearly as many breeding projects as Dan but I, I'm really excited about that one and then um, the pepper project that Rebecca is going to talk about or Annie someone's going to talk about it tomorrow um, the, out of that pepper project they're trying to develop a, a breed a blocky red bell pepper but some yellows popped up so I grew some of those yellows on our farm this year six different lines and one of them was just amazing so I'm very excited about that one and um, and I think our plant breeding work is what I, I, I love heirloom seeds but I also love creating or help, helping to develop new new varieties that will be around 50 years from now. So I'm interested in that kind of work. But the flowers may be the most. I'm going to pass because I'm going to be speaking tomorrow a bit about this. Uh, yeah, well, I'm working on the Pepper Project too. Um, but I've been doing a few projects over the years, both in tomatoes and... The last one I did was a tomatillo. I have a totally dark purple inside and out tomatillo. Like really dark purple. And it's like, it's sweeter than the the regular ones. It's just a really, really nice one. So every so often you find things. um, And when you grow seeds, you're always trying to improve on what you're growing. If you grow lettuces for seeds, you're going to pull out the one that's a bit different or doesn't look the way you want them. You pull them out so they don't get into the seed production. If you're growing peppers and you taste them and there's one that doesn't taste totally right, well, you're going to get rid of it. Actually, in the peppers, I've been growing the shishito peppers for 15 years. Nobody knew about it for that time. Now it's really popular. So... But mine has always been a little, a little bit hot. So this year what I did, I got some seeds from, from high mowing, said, okay, I'm gonna try to grow it to compare it to my own. And of course, the one that I got from high mowing is a lot milder, has basically no, no really heat to it. So now I end up with two different shishitos. So it's just things that comes out of it and you keep going with it. A few years ago, I had a hot pepper. It was a really cold summer, and I had had a hot pepper that I was trying out to grow. It was supposed to be um, a Greek pepperoncini, and it looked like it, 
But when I took one and tried to eat it when they were orange, it was super, super hot, like a habanero hot. I was just about to cut them down and throw them all away. And I said, no, hang on a second, wait. My habaneros had one or two fruits on them that year because of the cold summer. This one had up between 75 and 150 peppers on each plant. So of course, no, I didn't throw them out. I <laughs> kept seed and I'm still working on it. So th you always find little things like that you're gonna work on and try to improve or try to do something with. Uh, I do a fair amount of work on the dwarf tomatoes too. I guess I really like them and they produce fair amount even if they're short two foot plants. They still produce 30 to 40, 50 tomatoes per plant. And they don't need staking, they don't need tying up. It's just more convenient. Alors, il est 5 heures et quart. Um, ce que je proposerais, c'est uh, s'il y a des personnes dans l'audience qui ont des questions, ce serait le moment où on va toutes prendre des questions en rafale. Puis, um, vous pourriez répondre ben, comme ça vous vient. Um, Est-ce qu'il y, est qu y a des questions qui restent? Toujours des questions. N'est-ce pas? Right. Uh, okay. Um, quick version, which is not quick, is not enough. Okay. So we we should talk about. I, I'm like held hostage here. So um, <laughs> if you see me, you come corner me. Um, basically, the issue is that there is that the difficulty is about this whole bulk issue of bringing seed in, whether it's from any country. You know, it doesn't matter if it's from. Uh, France or if it's from uh, Thailand or if it's from the United States and that issue is basically someone who understands the paperwork process re re related to being an importer now those are both phytosanitary as well as just understanding okay this is going to hit a dock you've got to have a courier there or it's just going to sit there and if you don't hear from the people when it hits the dock you've got to bug them because they're not, they might have forgotten. So there's elements where this is what importers do, importers, exporters, or brokers. And brokers are commonly used in the seed, seed world to get, we use brokers to get seed from other countries. We also have in-house somebody who manages that if possible. It's cheaper to manage it in-house, but there's, it's always tricky. So my feeling is, is that if there's a large scale farm community or a market grower community that it's really about cooperating on the order. You know, it, if everybody wants to have 20 different orders, you can't, you know, then you're basically stuck in the same limitation that you are. If you have folks who are like willing to come together and say, okay, we really can order 20 pounds of this hybrid, or we actually want 300 pounds of this hybrid beet seed, then you can work in advance with the seed supplier, get it, take responsibility, even possibly work with a broker or state side to receive multiple shipments of seed and then have that one pallet popped from like three or four different seed companies. So, you know, Johnny's High Mowing, Fedco, whoever else, boom, goes to one broker, that one pallet gets shipped. So rather than having everybody ship 12 different sh orders, but that really involves an, it's like sitting down with someone like me and saying, well, how does that work? What is like, what is going on in this whole thing? And like becoming the solution. Like no one is gonna make it easy on you because they want their piece. So you have to know the game so that you make sure that you don't get ripped off. That's kind of how it rolls. So just like educating ourselves about seed growing, we become the solution. So that, that's the short answer is, is definitely doable. We just haven't gotten there and we can get there and it won't take that much work. It just becomes being more savvy about how the system works. It's, it's also important to know that different countries have different regulations and sending seed to the states is different than bringing seed in from the states. Very, very different. So those are... It's much easier to send seed to the states than it is to bring it in from the states. Yeah. So, again, we're open we're the easy. floor. <laughs> open the floor to questions. But Dan actually didn't get to talk about the radish. Maybe that's just my own <laughs> obsession. <laughs> I want to hear about the the, the radish, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> um, but actually, we could open the floor to questions. Uh, one last round, and then everyone could do a closing remark or just any last thoughts. Maybe you could talk about the radish. There's one guy and the gentleman there. 
Hi everyone, this is uh, not as much a question, but rather a comment. My name is Valerio Ojos Villegas. I'm an assistant professor in plant breeding and genetics and, uh, at uh, McGill University. I've uh, studied seed systems and uh, local seed, system, seed production for about 10 years now. And uh, I just want to say, it's my first time at this meeting, but the, I just want to say that uh, many of the groups that I've studied, both in developed and developing countries that have been successful at developing a market and addressing a, a, a niche in the market is because they have uh, implemented a framework with a strong foundation in technical and scientific uh, uh, if needs and, um, and development for uh, in, in their R&D sort of uh, uh, capacity. Uh, this is great. This has given those groups uh, very uh, empowered them with uh, with uh, with a new product that uh, that basically uh, makes them unique in the world market. Uh, and and I've, I've heard a lot about um, you know on the underpinning uh, plant breeding and the all the efforts and ideas that exist around the the room here. Um, in, uh, in around plant breeding, but also around quality uh, and the and the and the ability to product, produce a consistent and homogeneous product, and uh, a lot of that uh, comes with the management of, of from all of you as farmers, but also from the science that has been that uh, that supports the crops that you grow. Yeah, if you guys wanted to wrap up or share anything that maybe we didn't get to touch on, um, and Dan, you could talk about the radish. Come on. So my final remark is that there are a ton of emerging breeders, uh, both in your country and in the United States and elsewhere, that are looking for these collaborations with market growers and uh, seed companies. So for an example, there's a friend of mine, Jason Cavatorta, who is an independent breeder, runs a company called Earthwork Seeds. And so Jason is in love with Sharon Tay melons and has been breeding highly refined varieties of Sharon Tay melon um, that do well in the Northeast. But there's just not a huge market for Sharon Tay melons in, the, in, in America. What would we do? We don't even know how to pronounce it, let alone eat it. <laughs> so that's a kind of a collaboration where folks should be you know, re realizing that there is sort of young, hungry entrepreneurs who are doing amazing work that could benefit from your specific market and to reach out to like create those collaborations so that oh now instead of importing that seed you're growing that hybrid here for your growers collective which is providing excellent Sharon Tays for your you know your captive audience on this side of the border so thinking creatively and realizing that there's a dearth of big you know plant breeders that don't have affiliation with large scale corporations that can be accessed, are willing to create these kinds of you know, conversations and begin building something unique rather than thinking you always have to get it from whatever. You could actually target like those types of crops. So that's just sort of like a you know, concept. I don't have four hours, so I'll just say one quick thing. <laughs> um, I, what, what, I, I don't know, I just like to say that when, uh, when I moved from the restoration world into the seed world, I just can't believe like the, the richness of the, the people in this industry, in, in this business, and, and the sharing that goes on. Like we go on trips all over North America together, and you go down to high mowing, and Tom will like invite you in and stay in his house and talk to his CEO. People are, it's a really wonderful industry um, or business or community is the better word to be in and um, so I, I just think I, I just like to touch on the fact that like there's so much work we can all do together as seed companies as growers as co-ops whatever it's a really really wonderful group of people that's my closing um, do you want me to talk about the radish <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, if you do go on my blog, you can read more about it, so I'm not gonna wax too much, poetically too much, but um, in, I was just looking at the years, and on 2007 or 2008, I crossed a black radish, so it's the black skin with the white flesh inside, with a watermelon radish, which is the white outside with kind of a greenish top, and it's red on the inside. And I crossed this sort of dreaming of having sort of black on the outside and red on the inside. And, um, and, 
and I did. I, I started to find individuals like that within two years of uh, of the project, and I've been selecting out for the last ten years. And um, at this point, I do have a population. I have actually two populations: one that's black on the outside and red on the inside, and one that's black on the outside and purple on the inside. And they're 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 throwing out about seventy percent true to type now. And we're probably going to release it this winter because we're working it so long, and I'm I, I, I'm looking forward to having it out. So we're probably going to release it, even though it's it's not a hundred percent true to type, but we'll be reselecting continuously for the next well, forever is what is what we're doing and um and it's 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 really exciting and um uh, it's this is actually a picture of this radish was my first viral instagram sensation <laughs> <laughs> but um in the spring on our uh, on our turnisol account i posted a picture of it and the next morning there was like 450 likes and there were i mean for us this is viral i mean a, for some people this is just like well this is what i ate for breakfast but but th we, that's not how we roll um and um and it was i i still really hit on something with that um also um uh on my personal instagram post i've been posting pictures recently I've discovered that there's a radish community out there, and there are there's about four people doing that I've that I've discovered doing really interesting work with radishes. I knew there was a hot pepper community, but there's also a radish community, and um, and and I think this kind of answers a lot of the questions that's been brought up. Is that we're talking right now sometimes about replacing like providing all the provider bean seed that people grow on their market garden or whatever thing. And this can be purchased from Idaho for, I don't know, four or five dollars, but I'm not sure what the price is. And when you try to compete with that and you have a small business, you can't do that. But there's nobody out there who's offering black radish that has red inside. And so I've, I can corner that market. And maybe there'll be a lot of in, impersonators. <laughs> um, but, but that's one of the things is that developing new varieties or taking a variety, a tomato, a pepper, something else, bringing it to a climate that's a little bit too cold for that, selecting it over a while, having a better variety, this is something people are interested in. And there's no one that has that, like the alternative to it. And that's where I think you can really excite the consumer, and you can really excite the farmer, and you can really excite your fellow seeds people. And then those rad radish community on Instagram, they're really excited too. <laughs> so I think that, that, that that's what it is, is, is becoming really great at seed growing and selecting stuff and I, I didn't know Greta had all these projects because back when we used to talk about this stuff you didn't have that many and um, I think that what Greta's talking about all these projects this is part of being doing great seed saving is paying attention to what it is seeing the differences and accentuating the great differences and getting rid of the bad ones and um, and that's what makes for a really great seed community and it also makes for true terroir when we're looking to have something that's distinct for a bioregion and an area. Greta, you yeah, any final words? Yeah. Um, well, I just want to say one little thing. Me, for my seed business, like growing seeds is my living. So just producing my seeds every year, that's, that's my job, that's what pays the bill. Every year, I need a challenge. So that's trying to grow something that usually doesn't grow too well here or something try to new. And, but also have to have a fun thing in there every year because otherwise just work, 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 right? So the fun things is when you find something like that, something weird growing on your garden and you grow with that just for the fun of it, it might go somewhere. You might spend five years growing it and you sit and go, forget it, it's not going anywhere. That's the fun part, all those little weird things. So I, I just need that in my whole year of growing seeds. There has to be those three components in there. Ben, merci à nos présentateurs, Dan, Kim, Heron et Greta. Il est pas mal 5h30, c'est le temps du 5 à 7, je pense. Voilà. Merci à vous.